Let's study 10th standard ICSC biology chapter 7, chemical coordination in plants. Like animals and insects, even plants have hormones. The difference between the movements in plants and animals is that animals can locomote from one place to another, but plants can't. Although they can move their roots, shoot, leaves, and even flowers. And this movement is not due to any nervous system. They don't have any. So any coordination between different parts of the body of a plant is simply due to chemicals called hormones. Plants are producers. So they don't need to move rapidly, unlike animals who are consumers. That is the reason why the system of coordination between plants and animals is different. Because a nervous system gives us a quicker response. Plants usually don't respond very quickly. And the stimuli to which they respond include light, gravity, other chemicals, touch, etc. The term phytohormone was coined to distinguish a plant's hormone from animal hormones. Now let's study about some plant hormones. First, auxins. It was the first growth hormone discovered in plants. It was a very powerful growth stimulant. And in low concentration, they are very effective. Knowledge about these hormones can help agriculturists to grow better plants quickly. These hormones are also found in algae, fungi, etc. They are located mostly in actively growing regions which have meristematic tissue like shoot apex, root apex, the lateral meristems called cambium, etc. An example of auxin is IAA, that is indole-3-acetic acid. Now, the functions of auxin include growth of stem, roots and fruits by cell elongation, not by cell division. Second, there is a delay in leaf senescence, that is the aging or falling of leaves becomes slow. So it prevents old age in plants up to an extent. It also promotes the growth of apical buds. Apical means at the apex, the tips of roots and shoots. The buds are the growing parts of a plant. It inhibits the growth of lateral buds. So if in a plant we have a lateral bud and an apical bud, the lateral bud would have given rise to lateral branches and the apical bud allows the growth of the plant vertically. Auxins inhibit the growth of lateral buds and promote the growth of the apical buds. This phenomenon is called apical dominance because lateral buds are suppressed. Auxins also induce rooting in the cutting of some plants like rose, bougainvillea, etc. So if you cut a, a branch of a rose plant and you put it in the soil for vegetative propagation, auxins will help growth of the roots quickly. Auxins can also induce fruit formation without fertilization in fruits like apples. This is called parthenocarpy and the fruits are called parthenocarpic fruits. Parthenocarpy is all also possible in human beings. That is, a woman can get pregnant even without fertilization as described in some mythological stories. No, I'm kidding. It's not possible. It's just a mythological story. Gibberellins, the next kind of hormones. Examples are GA1, GA2, GA3. The most studied form is GA3. Don't confuse this with GTA. Where are they located? Well, mainly in the meristematic region again, like stems, apex, roots, apex, buds, etc. Functions to promote growth of the internodes by cell elongation. So this is similar to auxins. The, the tree's shoot has certain nodes. The region between the nodes is called internodes. Gibberins may also break seed dormancy. Don't call them gibberins. It's gibberins. It's not gibberish. They break the seed dormancy. So usually when new seeds are created. They are dormant. They cannot germinate immediately. They need to be mature first. But using these hormones, we can initiate germination forcibly in them. Gibberellins also promote fruit growth and they are also capable of parthenocarpy, another similarity with auxins. 
One more similarity, they delay senescence, that is the aging of the plant, of the leaves. They're also used widely in horticulture, that is flower and fruit production and production of ornamental plants and even in food industries because they help the increase in the length and the height and even in dwarf plants. They are used commercially to increase the length of grapes, to elongate apples and to improve their shape. Gibralic acid, which is a variation of this, is used to speed up the malting process in the brewing industry. Brewing industry is the industry of making alcohol, so you need not know about it in detail right now. Next hormone is cytokinins. Cytokinins have been discovered comparatively recently, only 1950s. That's just a few years ago. By Skoog and Miller. Perhaps they had no other work to do. Cytokinins have specific effects on cell division. They are widely distributed in plants and they are produced in the root tips and transported through xylem cells. Comparatively large amounts of cytokinins are found in germinating seeds, developing fruits and in the embryo which is inside the seed. What are the functions? Well, it stimulates plant growth but by cell division which is different from auxins and gibberellins because they stimulated uh, plant growth by cell elongation. They can even promote cell division in non metastomatic tissues like parenchyma. They can cause expansion of the cotyledons of seeds. They can break the seed dormancy. So in that respect, it is similar to gibberellins. And they can promote germination. They promote chlorophyll synthesis in chloroplasts. And even they delay leaf senescence. So that's one more similarity. However, one difference between cytokinins and auxins is that they inhibit apical dominance. So auxins promoted the apical dominance, but cytokinins inhibit that. The next hormone is ethylene. It is the only hormone which is a gas at ordinary temperature. A gas causing ripening of fruits was first found to be emanating from oranges, which helped in the ripening of bananas when stored together. So when oranges and bananas were stored together, interestingly, the bananas ripened very quickly. On further studies, we found that oranges were releasing a gas called ethylene which cause a ripening. Ethylene is produced in higher plants and in fungi and mostly in the meristematic tissue. Now the functions. The main function is to cause a reduction in the stem elongation and acceleration of senescence. So this is quite opposite to the previous hormones. This one will accelerate senescence. That is, it will accelerate the ripening of the fruits. They will cause reduction in stem elongation because rather the nutrients will be used in germination of seeds, in ripening of fruits, sprouting of potato tuber, promoting the root growth and root hair formation, and to induce flowering in mango tree. Because of so many functions, ethylene is the most widely used plant growth hormone in agriculture. Next, abscisic acid or ABBA. It is also a growth retarding hormone, which is found in angiosperms and gymnosperms and Pteridophytes and some mosses, which are thallophytes. And bryophytes. These are just different types of plants. It is found in the chloroplasts of leaves and fruits and seeds contain the highest amount of ABA. Okay, fine. Let's call it ABA. So ABA acts as a general plant growth inhibitor by slowing down plant metabolism. What is the use of that? Well, it induces seed dormancy. Now, that's a very different function compared to the others. It causes the seed to stop germinating. Perhaps if the conditions are unfavorable, the seed, seed should not germinate. Otherwise, the plantlet will die. So, it helps the seeds to withstand desiccation, that is extreme dryness, and other unfavorable conditions for growth. So, it's opposite to gibberellins in that respect. It accelerates senescence or aging and also abscission that is falling of leaves which goes hand in hand with senescence. It also stimulates the closure of stomata in the epidermis and increases the tolerance of plants to various kinds of stresses. That's why it's called the stress hormone. That was a good reason. Now this table is a good summary of the important points of the functions and the site of synthesis. So this should be the starting point 
to study the chapter. Now the next topic is the tropic movements in plants. The movements of the parts of the plant which take place in direct response to external stimuli such that the direction of the response is related to the direction from which the stimulus comes. Such a response is called tropism. So tropism is just one type of movement in plant. Another type of movement is called uh, nastic movement. But there, the direction of the motion of the plant is uh, independent of the direction of the stimulus. But in this chapter, we will only study tropism. So the growth movements occurring in response to the unidirectional external stimuli in a plant part are called tropic movements. For example, if the sunlight is falling in one direction, the motion will also be in a specific direction. So this is called a tropism. In fact, this is phototropism. It is a movement of plant parts towards light. This is positive phototropism because it is towards the stimulus. Roots show negative phototropism because they try to grow away from sunlight. This is obviously to ensure that the leaves, green leaves, get maximum exposure to sunlight to do photosynthesis. But how do the plants grow in the direction of the sunlight? They don't have any senses like we do, right? Well, in a way, they can sense sunlight and react to it. It's all about auxins. The hormones, they are affected by sunlight. For example, suppose this is a shoot. When sunlight falls on an area of the shoot, auxins migrate to the other area. A chemical reaction takes place. So the, the side of the plant, which is far away from sunlight, has higher concentration of auxins, which leads to elongation of cells and it grows faster compared to the surface exposed to the sunlight. So just like a bimetallic strip, even this will bend and it seems to us that it is bending towards sunlight. Now if you change the direction of sunlight, then it will start bending again towards the sunlight because now the auxins will be concentrated here. Next, geotropism. It's also called gravitotropism, but geotropism is more appropriate. It means the growth of plant parts towards the Earth's gravity. That is a positive tropism. You see, even if the uh, potted plant fell over, the roots would then start growing like this. They can sense the direction of gravity, the direction of the earth, and they start growing towards it. The shoots are negatively geotropic. They move away from the ground. This can be demonstrated with the help of an experiment. This rotating device is called a clinostat. As long as the clinostat is rotating and the potted plant is also rotating, we notice that the shoot and the root grow straight. Because as it is rotating, all the parts from all the angles, all the parts of the plant are exposed to gravity equally. So the distribution of those hormones, growth hormones will be equal in all the tissue surrounding the plant. So it will grow vertically. But if you don't rotate it, if you just keep it stationary, then the accumulation of the hormones will be unequal. Then the lower part will be exposed to gravity more than the upper part. And they will realize that, okay, earth is downwards and the roots will grow downwards and the shoot will grow upwards. So in this experiment, this is the control. Next, hydrotropism, that is movement of plant parts in response to water, is called hydrotropism. I prefer definitions with the phrase in response to and not with the phrase uh, towards. Because if you say towards, that means you're talking only about positive uh, tropism, not negative tropism. Rather, if you say that the term geotropism means growing of plant parts in response to Earth's gravity, that makes the definition more accurate. So, prefer that. Hydrotropism is uh, shown in roots. They are positive. If the shoot is growing away from moisture, it is negatively hydrotropic. Next, thigmotropism. Well, this is in response to the touch stimulus. For example, cascata and the vines of many plants, they wind around some support. But how do they know that there is a support out there? How does a tendril know? These plants need support because their stems are very weak. Well, they just grow 
randomly and the moment they send some touch then suppose this is the support and this is the plant suppose if this side senses a touch then the other side which is not in contact will grow longer compared to the side which is touching them so it tends to bend towards it and this process continues till it coils around it so this is called thigmotropism understand that uh, the snapping of the venus fly trap plant when the insect touches it is not thigmotropism you see tropism means the growth depends on the the direction of the growth depends on the direction of the stimulus whereas in insectivorous plants uh, the direction of the stimulus doesn't matter the movement is in a fixed direction also here there is a growth of the tissues whereas in the movements of insectivorous plants or even in a mimosa plant or a touch me not plant when they move there is no growth of tissues now in activity 4 we are investigating the effect of water on the growth of roots and shoots so it's hanging in the air it's given moist soil a moist sawdust we see that initially the radicals grow downwards that is gravitotropism but then they realize that water is up so they they can sense the moisture and they start moving upwards this means that hydrotropism took precedence and it is a more powerful stimulus than gravity if we try to grow plants in space where there is no gravity the observations are quite fascinating finally we have chemotropism the best example is that of a pollen tube growing from a germinating pollen grain from the stigma through the style to the ovary reaching the ovule if you remember the pollen grain has male gametes which pass through the pollen tube to germinate to fertilize the female gamete inside the ovule so that the ovule can become the seed and the fertilized egg will become the zygote which will in future become the embryo which will in future become the plant which will in future become the paper of books so how do the pollen tube know that the ovule is here well certain chemicals are released by the style and by the various parts directing the pollen nucleus the tube nucleus in the right direction another example is that of the tentacles of the drosera plant towards any source of nutrition so they can sense it because of the chemicals released even fungi start growing towards the area richer in food because of chemotropism now a special type of tropism is heliotropism shown by sunflowers as the sun moves across the sky even the sunflower which always faces the sun changes its direction so that it can face the, sky, the sun at all the times this special type of phototropism is called heliotropism where helio means the sun hi students this is aj sir if you like this video press the like button if you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures email me or message me on instagram check the description for more information